I should have been more worried about Mike. I should have listened more. I should have paid more attention. I should have just been there. But I was 17 and selfish and so absorbed in my own little world that I couldn't be bothered to actually hear what he was trying to tell me. At the same time, I was only 17, sheltered, and I didn't know what to do with the information he was trying to give me. That doesn't excuse me or dismiss the guilt. While we drifted a bit apart recently, we'd been best friends in second grade. I should have at least tried to do something, but by the time I realized how bad things had gotten, it was too late. Mike disappeared two days before his 18th birthday, halfway through our senior year of high school. Two days later, on his birthday, the gargoyle song started. They were first heard by a small search party that was combing the woods for any sign of Mike. They said it sounded distant and came from the direction of the old Catholic church, long abandoned after the town moved a few miles down the road. But they didn't know exactly what it was. Given the seriousness of their task, they didn't go to investigate, instead continuing on with their hunt for clues. Across town from where the group was, I was sitting in my guidance counselor's office while she and the police officer asked me questions about my friend. Did he seem upset to you at all recently? Mrs. Gerald was studying me with a calm intensity that made me fidget uncomfortably in my chair. The cop was seated beside her, but he seemed less intimidating somehow. I don't know, I said. Mike was uh, always kind of... I don't know. Not really sad, just, just kind of quiet. Was he quieter than usual? The cop, I, I think he said his name was Thule, asked. I thought hard. I knew I hadn't done anything wrong, that I'd certainly not been involved with Mike going missing, but I still felt accused. Like I should know something, because we'd been so close. I could only shrug. He'd had a fight with his dad, I, I guess. I, I think that kinda had him down. Do you know what the fight was about? They just didn't really get along. That was an understatement. And I knew it. How many times had Mike told me they'd gotten into it over stupid stuff? His grades, which never fell below a C. His lack of girlfriend. His weight. His hobbies. His dad was constantly picking on him. His dad's Jim Macy, right? The fire chief. I nodded to the cop and he jotted something down in his notebook. They asked a few more questions, like if I knew any particular places Mike liked to hang out, and if he'd said anything unusual the last time I'd seen him, but I didn't have any answers for them. Not really. After I was allowed to leave, I decided to skip my next period and walked right out of the school building, across the courtyard and over the football field, where Mike and I would hang out under the bleachers when we didn't feel like going to class. I half expected him to already be there, waiting for me, but there was no Mike. I plopped down with a heavy sigh and laid back down with my head on my backpack. The last time I'd seen him, he hadn't seemed particularly upset. But something had been off, I supposed. Mike was always rather serious, but that day, he'd seemed dull. What's up? I asked him. But I think we both knew I wasn't asking for the soul-bearing, deep and dirty details. So he had told me he'd had another fight with his dad. That sucks, I said. Yeah, he doesn't want me going out to state for college. Why not? He's afraid he won't be able to make sure I don't get into a faggy major. But you want to be a teacher? He was absently scratching something into the underside of a bleacher behind me. He wants me to be an engineer. You hate math. Art is for fags. Could always go for history. Mike was quiet for a moment. I wish I'd said something then. Apologized for not understanding. I told him it was okay to do whatever he wanted and his father could fuck off. But I didn't say anything. I was too busy flipping through a comic I'd brought with me. I guess, Mike said at last. And then we just sat there, him scratching at the bleacher, me reading, until the bell rang and it was time to go. Mike didn't say anything else to me as we walked out and parted ways, and I didn't even really notice.
Angeles. I sat up and looked at the place where Mike had been stretched out the last time I'd seen him. What exactly had he been scratching into the underside of a bleacher anyways? I wondered. Furious, I crawled over to his spot and craned my neck to see. A crude, deeply gouged outline of a bird with outstretched wings was carved deep into the pale wood. I frowned, a bit disappointed that it was just a simple doodle of sorts, and ran a finger over it. I hadn't realized how badly I had wanted it to be a clue, something that would have told me where he was. Out in the woods across town, unbeknownst to me, the gargoyle song was becoming louder and more fervent. By the time I had got home, it was all anyone on the local news could talk about. Citizens have been calling in reports of unusual sounds from out on the western side of town since early this morning. Some are saying the source of the noise, which is said to be a loud, harsh bellow, is coming from St. Anthony's Catholic Church, which hasn't been in use since 1967. Because of the stone gargoyles that decorate the suspected location, people have dubbed the noise the gargoyle song. A brief clip of the sound, which was a short series of low, rumbling calls captured from a distance, was played. Police say an investigation is underway, but they won't be able to get inside until they determine whether the building is safe to enter. In the meantime, officials urge people to stay away from the church as these could be the sounds of structure beginning to fail. I flipped the TV off when the reporter switched to his next story about local missing teen, Mike Macy, and my friend's picture flashed across the screen. Seeing him on there was like a punch to the gut, one that almost had me throwing up. I went up to my room to get some homework done in the hopes it would help take my mind off Mike. After dinner that night, while I was watching a show with my parents, the house phone rang. Mom went to pick it up, and after a brief exchange of pleasantries, told me it was for me. Hello, I said. Anthony? Yeah. It's Mr. Macy. I'd already known from his voice alone, few people could manage to sound so displeased with you using so few words. Uh, yes, sir? You haven't seen my boy, have you? He asked. There was no distress in his voice, no concern, only a note of suspicion, maybe even contempt. N not since Monday. Are you sure? Yes, sir. You wouldn't be lying for him, would you, Anthony? Because right now he's the only one in trouble. But if I find out you're helping him pull off this nonsense, I'll have words for you, too. N no, sir. It was hard to keep my voice from trembling with anger. Cop said you claim not to know anything. I, I don't. Y you sure? He asked again. Yeah. See, uh, he told his mother on Monday night that he was going to your house. I, I just mumbled some kind of half-assed apology about not knowing anything about that. So, when he said he was going to Anthony's, he was uh, lying, huh? Uh, I guess. His mom didn't want us bothering you because she thinks you're upset enough over this bullshit, but you understand that we need to follow up. Yeah. Call if you're anything. We hung up and I almost spit at the phone. Did he really wonder why Mike might have gone away? My parents asked if everything was okay and if I needed to talk about what was going on. But I insisted I was fine and said I was going to bed. I lay awake long after I'd shut myself in my room, staring at my ceiling and wondering where Mike had gone. Of course he'd have told him he was coming here. It was the most logical place for him to run when he was upset. But I was still annoyed with him, he could have at least left the clue. I let my eyes drift shut, trying to shut off my brain and tune out any thoughts of my friend. And I just focused on a little black hole of sleep that was starting to spread through my body. Going to Anthony's, I heard Mike say from the darkness. But you didn't. I sleepily accused him. You didn't come here. Where did you go? I'm going to Anthony's. Where are you? I heard a distant call, deep and rumbling and repeated. It was the gargoyle song. It sounded again, closer this time, right beside my head. I sat up sharply and looked groggily around my room, trying to make sense of what I was hearing. 
That's another recording. This time from Anna Grigova. Wow, she must have been close, huh? The early morning announcer from the radio show that my clock alarm played every day at 5.30 said that after the gargoyle song ended. It had been my alarm going off, I realized. I must have fallen asleep, dreamed of Mike, and the alarm went off while the show was doing a segment on the gargoyle song. I exhaled sharply, rubbing a hand agitatedly through my hair. And that's all the time we have for the Gargoyle song this morning, folks. If you find yourself out St. Anthony's Way and get a good recording, remember to send it in and you just might hear it on air. St. Anthony's, I thought slowly. I'm going to St. Anthony's, Mike said in the back of my mind. He'd never been coming to my house at all. It was still dark when I ran out of my house and climbed into my car. It occurred to me dimly and easily pushed aside that I should call the Macy's or the cops, but I didn't. I was 17, I was selfish, and all I was thinking about was finding Mike. I could hear the gargoyle song before the old church came into view. It was a strange series of dull humming sounds and low pitchy cries. I followed it all the way up to the long drive to the church's entrance. It loomed tall and imposing over me. A leftover relic of stone and stained glass from an earlier time. I was surprised there were no cops stationed outside to keep curious people from getting inside, but I figured our small force didn't have that kind of manpower to allow for someone to hang around all the time. No doubt there'd be a patrol by at some point though, so I knew I had to hurry. The song was much louder now, the same steady hum accompanied by what now sounded like screeches that rose and fell like waves. Yellow police tape stuck out against the large doors, still dark in the pre-dawn, and I was careful to avoid it as I pushed my way in. If there had been any locks on the door at some point, they'd rusted beyond use now, for which I was grateful. The smell that hit me the moment I was fully inside was almost enough to knock me from my feet. It was a mildew and a stench of old shit, of animal and rock. I heaved and had to clap a hand over my mouth and nose to keep from hurling. The sound was so loud now that I could feel it vibrating in my back teeth. A terrible shrieking that filled the air above my head. It was no longer low and rumbling, but high and piercing, and the humming had turned into a frenzied hammering. My head throbbed painfully and I looked up, desperately trying to locate the source of the noise but my eyes hadn't yet adjusted to the gloom of the church's interior. Suddenly something small and dark whizzed by my face, a small screeching shadow that had me reeling backwards with a frightened yelp. Another followed suit, and then another, so close that I could reach out and touch them, and sheer terror almost made me turn and flee without looking for Mike. And then one of the things ran full tilt into my side and careened to the floor, where it lay for a moment, stunned. It was just long enough for me to make out what it was in the creeping grey light of early morning. A bat. One of hundreds, maybe thousands, that had made home in the abandoned church's rafters. It was beating off their wings that hummed and hammered. It was their frantic calls, distorted and muted by stone walls that had been the gargoyle song. And soon enough, once I was able to bring myself to move forward, through the bat droppings and other blown-in debris that covered the floor, I figured out why they had become so wild. I found Mike sitting behind the pulpit. It was still too dark to make out his features, but I knew it was him all the same. A few empty pill bottles were scattered around his body. I sank to the floor beside him suddenly unaware of the smell and the noise and my horror, and I stared at his bowed head. The logical part of me, the part that was trying to stay in control, to keep me from having a breakdown, assumed the scent of death and the presence of his body, so unfamiliar and a possible threat had driven the bats from their roost and sent them into a flurry. As the sun continued to rise, casting streaks of colored light through the windows, I noticed Mike had a piece of paper on his lap. It only had a single sentence written on it. I'm sorry I can be 
who you wanted me to be. I read it over and over again, even as the tears streamed down my cheeks and I grabbed the sleeve of his shirt in my fist. I'm sorry, I, I couldn't be who you needed me to be, I managed to choke out. I sat there with him for hours, until a cop pulled up and saw my car outside and came in to investigate. The entire time, the bat's head continued to swirl overhead, screeching their gargoyle.